here we go again. Really, the last time I was invited to speak to a TED audience, the nuclear threat had reared its ugly head. There were words of fire and fury like the world has never seen. And this got friends calling me and asking, am I safe from North Korea's ballistic missile threat? This time, it's talk of consequences you've never faced in your history that have my friends calling. Words issued from a different nuclear armed leader. Yet, doesn't it all sound all too familiar? The difference this time is that nuclear weapons are not merely being brandished in a, uh, a joust, a verbal joust between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, but they're being used by Vladimir Putin as a tool to try to blackmail the world. Nuclear weapons have emboldened his aggression and enabled war crimes. Not since the end of the Cold War have nuclear weapons and the threat been brandished so uh, brashly. And this time, three things have stood out to me. The public's reluctant awakening to a threat that's long been there. The difference between theory and reality and the uncertain nuclear future that all of us face. So when it comes to this public awakening, the war in Ukraine has sparked renewed attention to nuclear weapons. And for some, the fear is new. Duck and cover drills were something they heard about from their grandparents. But suddenly, nuclear weapons have shifted from an abstraction to a dangerous reality in the public consciousness. Polling shows that half of Americans are very concerned that Putin would use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And nearly half of Americans are just as concerned that Russia would target the US with nuclear weapons. Nearly 70% of Americans surveyed by the American Psychological Association said they are worried that the invasion of Ukraine is going to lead to nuclear war and that they fear we're at the beginnings of World War III. Well, when the Cold War ended, we were lulled into a false sense of security and complacency as we allowed ourselves to focus less on nuclear weapons. This is understandable given the many issues that threaten communities today. And these kinds of threats are more acute and regular than the threat of nuclear weapons. But the nuclear threat never fully went away. And in fact, it's grown in recent years. And now the complacency of the past few decades is coming back to haunt us. In many ways, this is our current day Cuban Missile Crisis. People were shocked and scared by Vladimir Putin's thinly veiled threat of nuclear use over Ukraine, as he reminded the world of Russia's nuclear arsenal. And Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said in an interview on CNN, that Russia's nuclear policy is to use nuclear weapons when faced with an existential threat. This is nothing new. In fact, the US has the very same policy. But when Putin claimed that the harsh sanctions the US and its allies have imposed on Russia since early March, when he referred to them as like a declaration of war, shivers went down my spine. Could Putin really try to justify a nuclear strike in response to a financial punishment for a war that he himself started? This begs the question, what counts as an existential threat to a country and who gets to make that call? This is a question we should be asking of each nuclear power, including the United States. And in all of this, we're reminded that our fate is left in the hands of a powerful few, including those whose judgment has proven questionable in the past and suggests a recklessness in the future. When it comes to the gap between theory and reality, when I first learned about nuclear weapons back in Australia in high school, all those years ago, I was mortified yet fascinated at the same time. 
mortified that we had enough destructive power to destroy civilization as we know it many times over. Yet I was fascinated at the macabre logic of mutually assured destruction. It's a logic that purports to keep the peace. And it says if, if one side attacks the other, the other can respond in kind, causing mass destruction for both sides, thus deterring either side from using weapons first. It's, it's kind of sick and twisted when you think about it, but it makes sense. Until, that is, reality gets in the way. Russia's war in Ukraine completely discredits the claim that nuclear weapons keep the peace. Instead, Russia's nuclear arsenal is enabling Putin's aggression and war crimes, and he is threatening nuclear war in order to shape the US and NATO response, hardly keeping the peace. Now, the US response is puzzling to many people. Why, they ask, can't the US and NATO send troops to help Ukraine? Why are they only helping to arm them? And why can't the US and NATO enforce a no-fly zone as President Zelensky is so strongly requesting? Well, the answer is that US is trying to do everything it can to avoid a direct confrontation between NATO and Russian forces. Because engagement between military forces of major nuclear powers could escalate to nuclear use, potentially nuclear war. Setting up and enforcing a no-fly zone means actively taking out Russian air defence systems and potentially shooting down Russian planes that enter the no-fly zone. This is a surefire recipe for escalation. Now Putin, now, Putin is banking on this response. The question is, for us, what happens after Ukraine? Will the international community hold Putin to account, not only for the egregious war crimes, but also for threatening to annihilate civilians indiscriminately? Or will his lesson be that nuclear threats win the day? And in the big picture, now that Putin's gone there with the nuclear threat, how does the world live with Putin in the future? So thinking about this uncertain future and stepping back from the Ukraine crisis, it's clear that Ukraine is a symptom of a much larger problem when it comes to nuclear weapons. We rely on outdated assumptions to guarantee our security. We assume perfect information that will allow us to decipher an opponent's moves with certainty. We assume we understand the other nations and the other leaders' rationality and that we'll never make a mistake. And we assume that the theory of mutually assured destruction developed in the 50s is the best we can do in these times. Does this all truly make us safer? It hasn't seemed to for the people of Ukraine. We leave all of these assumptions unchecked at our peril. I worry about the next crisis after Ukraine because there will be more. It's time to stop thinking about nuclear risk only in the immediate term and be planning for the longer term to challenge assumptions that don't seem to work. We need to think about what behaviour we're willing to accept and what role nuclear weapons play in this. The outrage that so many of you have expressed is an indicator that you're not satisfied with the status quo either. We need to take control over the future and fundamentally change the dynamics at play. So to do that, we need to include people who are normally kept out of discourse and debate and decision making. For far too long, this topic has been relegated to a select few and wrongfully deemed too complex for wider input. But we're no better off now than we were in the 1950s and it's all of our futures at stake. And there are ripple effects that we are seeing with this crisis. Second order effects from a conflict of this nature, such as humanitarian impacts, refugees, food shortages, famine, war crimes. So we need to look at this issue holistically. We need systemic thinking 
about the way nuclear weapons interact with other global problems. We need to harness the brain power and know-how of the modern age. We need to involve people in this conversation from a range of disciplines, like social psychology, behavioral economics, neuroscience, art, and technology. We need involvement of people with a range of lived experiences, including those most impacted by nuclear weapons use and development. And importantly, we need an educated public that understands the stakes, that understands posture, and that understands the destructive power of all nuclear weapons, even so-called small ones. And we need a public that understands that the endless race to develop ever more lethal weapons raises our risk rather than lowers it. We need a public that is willing to weigh in on this, that is willing to tell their elected officials what they think. In short, we need all of you. It's always an honour to talk to a TED audience. If there's a next time, I hope it's about progress we've made at thwarting this existential threat of our time, about the application of human ingenuity to solve complex problems, and not as a wake up call because we've another crisis, a crisis potentially even more devastating than this one. <laughs>